good morning. Um, thank you for joining us for the worship round this morning. Uh, if you are an Emory University or healthcare employee, I would like to receive the CME credit uh, for attending today. The access code is 628778. And this can also be found in the chat feature at the bottom of your screen uh, for our virtual attendees. Uh, if you have any issues with this webinar or the CME login, uh, please send Kadir to Profana an email, or you can also drop the notes via the chat feature. Uh, this morning, it has been a great pleasure uh, to welcome Dr. Baidei Abadani. Uh, Dr. Abadani received a medical degree, MBBS from Calicut Medical College in Calicut, India. She subsequently completed her residency in anatomic and clinical pathology at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. Uh, she came to Emory University School of Medicine, where she completed a cytopathology fellowship and a GI pathology fellowship as well. Uh, she is assistant professor in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine here at Emory, and she is also the Director of Cytopathology at the Green Memorial Hospital. As a surgical pathologist, Dr. Abadani's clinical focus is centered around aspects of GI histopathology, including the diagnosis of complex appendiceal colon, stomach, and pancreatic cancers. Uh, she has a report collaboration with the uh, GI oncology care team at Green Memorial Hospital and is also involved in the GI pathology and cytopathology service at uh, Emory University Hospital and Emory University Hospital Midtown, uh, leading the edge in using innovative digital pathology techniques in diagnosis of GI malignancies. Uh, she's a member of the Cancer Prevention and Control Research Program here at Winship, and our research currently involves improving diagnostic accuracy by medical invasive procedures with an emphasis on cytomorphology in multiple organ systems. She has published multiple eye impact pathology journals and is a contributor to the WHO 2022 International System for Reporting Pancreatobiliary Cytopathology. Please welcome Dr. Baidei Abadari today for a talk, The Pathologist's Role in the Era of Personalized Medicine, The Evolution of Digital and Molecular Pathology. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, Dr. Olesanti, thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, and thank you for the invite because uh, this I felt was very important for me to get to communicate with all the oncologists and the different uh, branches which are involved in the Bishop Cancer Center for Patient Care. So uh, the topic today is the pathologist's role in the era of personalized medicine. So we cannot get, uh, you know, th that's the highlight of the term, right? Personalized medicine. And what is it each, um, uh, each provider or each, uh, each physician contributing to this concept of personalized medicine? So in pathology, now there's the evolution of digital pathology, artificial intelligence, and molecular pathology. So we go about what is the pathologist's role and, and where are we in the current uh, paradigm. I have no conflicts of interest. So the learning objectives for uh, the talk today is the role of the pathologist in diagnostic and management, clinical management workflow, understand the functioning of a digital pathology workflow, challenges and role of the pathologist in a digital workflow, uh, understand the role of the pathologist in a molecular pathology workflow, and understand the utility and challenges of molecular pathology testing and digital pathology setup. I felt that each one of us is important for the whole um, uh, system to understand because without the buy-in of the clinicians, the oncologists, the administration, we cannot set up a digital pathology and molecular pathology workflow in the hospital. And it cannot be the, the, um, the role of only the pathology department. And, and I, will, I will further explain why. So what does a pathologist or surgical pathologist do? 
Um, and, and the picture credit is Dr. Jennifer Kasten. We have a great Facebook pathology moms group, and we discuss everything from finance to um, budget and uh, child care issues and also pathology. So uh, diagnosis and histopathologic classification of tumors, diagnosis of benign but pathologic disease, tumor of origin and assessment of immunostains. And that was um, in 1970s, immunostains was a thing. Everybody thought we'll get immunostains and we'll just diagnose everything. Nobody has to look at it. Put the stain there and you will come to know what the tumor is. Margin evaluation from rejection, uh, resections, mitosis counts to see the grade and, and, and um, see how bad it is. Adverse prognostic features, we we'll assess for lymphovascular invasion, perineural invasion, poorly differentiated features of um, the tumor. Prognostic predictive therapeutic marker analysis, for example, the common ones, ERPR, HER2, and, and right now PDL1. Lymph node metastasis. <laughs> So what happens to the patient's tissue once out? It's post biopsy or post surgery. So we receive it in the lab and where it is uh, gross. It is gross manually. And the tissue is received in a fixative. It is kept in a formalin, which is a common fixative. It is processed in histology, which includes fixation, embedding, cutting, and staining. And then it is delivered to the pathologist, review under microscope on glass slide. And this has been going on for um, from uh, for years, more, more than uh, 100 years now. Deliver to the scanner. So this is a new paradigm. If there is digital pathology in the workflow, it can be the slides. Once out from histology is delivered to the scanner where a technician is involved. And then it is delivered to pathology digitally. And that is uh, reviewed in on, on the uh, screen. So this is an example. This is our workflow. And I want, I have kept the pictures with the hands to show you that this is where the manual labor is. And, and this is where we need the staff. If, if we don't have staffing for this, we cannot get that step done. And, and there is no way that we can get to digital pathology without that hand. So this is the first one where the specimen is out and um, lung, spleen, whatever resection is done. So the, the growth evaluation is done of what tissue needs to be submitted into the cassette. This is what a cassette is. Uh, a cassette is. So I've been, um, uh, right now, I get a lot of calls from Emory as, um, you know, they, there are companies that are uh, interacting and they want to automate and they want to see what part of pathology can be automated. So they want to understand our workflow. And they have employed students or postgrads, and then they call us. We have a Zoom meeting. And then I explain to them, this is the workflow. And they say, what's a cassette? What do you mean? So I'm like, come to the, you know, you cannot think about the workflow and automate something if you don't know what is actually happening. You know, this is not something that you can imagine. So this is tissue, and then you put it in the cassette. The cassette goes into a processor. Now that part is automated. You know, there are all the chemicals there. It goes through formalin, alcohol, whatever is needed. It goes through, we have, um, and it's monitored. It's overnight after the tissue is grossed in the morning uh, sometime. Overnight, we have the processing. And then in early morning, maybe 4 a.m. or 5 a.m., some um, histotech comes to the lab and does the embedding in the wax. So those are those, um, and that's the next step where the small tissue is put in. And that is also partially automated. The next step is to cut it. And this is a microsome where the tissue is cut because we have the wax, you can have thin micro sections and um, the usual cutting um, thickness is four to five micrometers. And it is important that the, the, the histotech knows what is the thickness. For example, I want to get a Congo red stain. You say, you know, I'm thinking of amylodosis and I want to get a Congo red stain. I ordered the Congo red stain. Now the histotech should know what is the thickness that I need for the Congo red stain. Now, if he gives me a five micrometer thickness and gives me the Congo red stain, there is no way I can evaluate for it. I cannot see the apple green bioreference even if there. So I need the 10 micrometer, I need the thickness, the appropriate thickness. And that is the knowledge base of the histotech when he sees the order Congo red, what is the thickness I need? And that's what I'm going to cut. So that is the workflow. And then after the cutting is done, you can see how the hand goes again to pull up the wax, the thin slice, the thin smear, uh, wax strip to put it onto the slide. 
And then that slide is put in an automatic stainer where, um, you know, and finally I get the glass slide. So now let's talk about how you, you got the glass slide. And then the glass slide, now it is also cover slipped and dried and cleaned. So then the glass slide now, from this paradigm to the digital pathology, it needs to be digitized. So the h &E slide is sent to the room where it is scanned. There is a scanner and there is a batch of slides. You know, we have a high throughput scanner and we put it into scanning and then the digital image is created. So in 2021, the Emory Department of Pathology committed to building a platform for digital primary diagnosis. And I want to say that Dr. Jeffrey Smith is, is a hero because even with the least amount of help and you know he has um, he has developed almost single-handed his works like to, I, and I, I really admire his uh, resilience and, and dedication to get the right thing done because um, you know you can order the machines, uh, whatever it is, and then get started, and then the whole thing falls down. There is no maintenance. So he, from uh, he has focused on getting the rights-based uh, workflow done. So uh, this is the histology slide. This is the glass slide. We know how it comes, and then it goes to the whole slide imaging system. Then there's a digital pathology pack, which the radiology department had bought first, and then it goes to the digital pathology display, which further goes to the pathologist on his. Um, Screen. Now, the, the idea is that digital pathology will have more productivity, better diagnosis, improved collaboration among pathologists for consensus and um, you know, expertise and um, location transparency. So then, um, so that is our basic, you know, building a very good car is very, very important. And then you can add on whatever accessories you need. So these are our accessories. You need your, computational image processing, you want to do KI-67, you want to do ERPR automation. Those are the accessories that can be added to your um, uh, strong foundation, and that, that's the car. But if, if this is not worked out properly, you can buy a platform and then think, okay, this company is giving me for something cheaper, he has a platform. But then if I cannot add my accessories to that platform, it's a complete waste of my initial capital investment. So the, the basics that, so you need a person or a team who is dedicated to getting the right thing done in the first place. So your capital investment is, is uh, worthwhile. The next step I'll talk about is the, um, so digital imaging, it's not um, that you scanned it and, and it's perfect. So there is a QC system that has to be implied. And, and the, the efficacy and the efficiency of your um, digital imaging is uh, what kind of a QC system did you establish in the first place? So the, for the QC system, what I mean is from the slide, you scan it, you get a whole slide image, you accept. And then if it is not good enough, somebody is looking at it, right? It, and it can be automated to some extent. And then there's a manual uh, QC algorithm, and then it can be manually reviewed. If it is um, re uh, reviewed, it is rejected, it can be sent to the scanner again, and that can be done. If it is um, second time, again, it comes back to the algorithm and then second time rejected, you just go give the slides to the pathologist, right? So this is our, um, you know, you, your, your, if you're missed slides, your QC is missed, the number of slides that are missed as you, and, and the scan time is related. So the, the lower the scan time, the higher missed slides will be there. So you have to find the right balance for your laboratory where you need the least number of missed slides the best scanning time for your uh, round time to be effective. Because if you increase the scanning time, you have missed slides, and then you go back to the scanner and the, uh, you know, the circle is again there. So the, the digital image is not sent to the pathologist and you know, that, that's, that's where the turnaround time will be lost. So the QC establishment of a good QC system is again, the prerogative of the pathologist who's involved with the digital pathology workflow setup. So coming to the paradigm, so in uh, 1700s, we had the microscope, and then we got the, um, you know, it's looking at the glass slide, and then uh, immunostains came about, special staining and ISC, and then we started diagnosing tumors and tumor of origin using the ISCs. And after that, we came in the 2000s, uh, we came up with molecular diagnostics. And then again, we came with, okay, this is perfect. 
get the tissue, put it in the molecular diagnostic, uh, like I put it in the uh, machine, get the report, and there you are. This is the tumor of origin. Perfect. But again, we came to the same cycle. Oh, it's not good enough. We we want more. And that's what where we come. The future always belongs to the discontented. You know, this this is the hall which says that. So we we found that it's giving us a wrong the wrong um, information or it is not applicable to this tumor. I don't know what to do with this. It's not effective. So we need uh, more. So now the next step is, but we see. The common part, the glass slide is not gone. And I will repeat that again, the glass slide. Who is making the glass slide is also not gone. So we have we, we have to remember about the staffing issue about the glass slide. You know, that is uh, the investment that the pathology department has to put in. No glass slide, no, 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 nothing else. So, so digital pathology. So what is it? It is a using a scanner to take a glass slide and make a digital image. Then artificial intelligence is building algorithms to give answers. I want to know um, how bad it is, the lymphovascular invasion, the uh, perineural invasion. Uh, is it affecting overall survival? So I build an algorithm to evaluate the digital image and, and then give that. Computational pathology is use of artificial intelligence tools like these algorithms to extract information from whole slide images, plus or minus the clinical data I have for that patient. So these are the terms thrown around as if everything is automated, it's going to be perfect, and, and there is no human involved, uh, but that's not it. I think there is more human involvement now than even before. Before it was one pathologist, look at the glass slide, put the diagnosis in. Now it is like I'm dependent on the technician to come on time, put the slide on the scanner. I want him to do the QC properly and then give the digital. If, you know, every step is, I, I'm, I'm dependent on every little step uh, and even more steps are included till I get my um, case to put in the diagnosis. So what is going on? Um, is there some way I can, yeah, I think so. So what is going on in the field of digital pathology, recent updates? So most of our um, digital pathology questions are revolving around quantitative analysis and uh, AI-driven assessment. So AI-driven assessment is artificial intelligence-driven assessment uh, that we talked about before. So um, already in the market, there is FDA-approved tests, and that is one of them is Pages Prostate Detect, where uh, they have already made a program um, where there's grading and quantification of the prostate biopsies and, uh, and page prostate perineural invasion. It's, it's, it's a robust set, and they, they claim it to be that um, they, the, it can review the scanned whole, Im, whole slide image from prostate needle biopsies prepared with h &E chain. Now, the question for uh, each of the laboratories, academic center or community centers, is like, what is the cost-benefit analysis? Um, when you buy this software, um, the, they, they, it does the review for you, and a pathologist has to review again and then you deal with the updates of the software, what is the soft, uh, hardware that you need to run this program. Um, so right now, the question for the pathologist is, is it, is it beneficial or is it, uh, I can do this job anyway. Uh, why do I need this um, uh, automated uh, artificial intelligence system to do it? Now, the, 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 the something to consider is the time. Now, probably the computer will do it much faster. And, um, but then, somebody has to review it, like, did it go, did, do it right? So I have to look the, look at the whole image again. Did it catch the cancer properly? Did it miss anything? So if it is a large scale, like I have 1,000 prostate biopsies to look at it in a day, I, I, I cannot. I cannot do that as a human, right? But a computer can probably help me look at the important ones and, and uh, highlight the smaller tissue that I need to grade or question. But that is if I trust the, the algorithm to give me the right filter. So there is um, that, that next question comes, how, how uh, because ultimately I am signing it out and I am the person who is liable when the things are wrong, not the person who made the software or the who sold it to me or anyone else, right? So that is our role. Like why, why should I adapt this uh, unless the liability issue is also shared with someone else? They have also uh, included others like page breast detect and neoplasm, where um, they do ERPR and it, it, it's also, um, sorry, it, it, it uh, draws attention to areas of interest where suspicious for cancer, and then it uh, stratifies the uh, neoplasms by subtype. 
that phage breast mitosis because now KI67 is, um, uh, is included in all um, evaluation of breast biopsies. And um, th th that is the software that can do that. And then there's phage breast lymph node for lymph node metastasis. It identifies areas of suspicious and then the pathologist has to review it. There's also HER2 complete and it aids in the HER2 um, evaluation of um, HER2 expression. So let's, uh, I, I selected this breast cancer paradigm because it is discussed all the challenges that um, pathologists, researchers, um, and even uh, basic science researchers are facing in deploying um, artificial intelligence and digital pathology to clinical uh, applications. So triple negative breast cancer and HER2 breast positive breast carcinoma show pronounced tumor associated immune cell infiltrate. Now they are prognostic and predictive potential uh, for the tumor in, uh, infiltrative lymphocytes in the um, uh, triple negative breast cancer. Each 10% increase in the uh, tumor infiltrated lymphocytes associated with 17% increase in overall survival. So better TILs, better overall survival. So what are TILs? They are mononuclear immune cells, lymphocytes, and plasma cells. Now the computer or the algorithm has to identify these cells correctly. Uh, so there is intratumoral TILs and then there is traumal TILs. Now, um, the stromal TILs are the more important thing. So the, again, the algorithm has to identify, separate the intratumoral TILs from the stromal um, TILs correctly. So pitfalls in machine learning based assessment of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in breast cancer. This is published in the Journal of Pathology 2023. I, I think it's an excellent paper to understand um, the, the pitfalls and, and what the challenges are. So uh, um, the one is including wrong areas or cells. We know what the cells are and we need the lymphocytes, the plasma cells, right? But the algorithm is including apoptotic bodies, neutrophils, and also some neuroendocrine, low-grade neuroendocrine tumors are included in the count. So then when it's automated, I have to be very careful and I re-review re of the slide, right? Um, then technical factors which impact algorithms. And this is applicable to every everything, uh, slide related. We have a glass slide, there could be pen markings in it. So the when there is scanning, it sees the pen marking and thinks it is something and, and uh, you know focuses on that pen marking and then your scanning is not uh, all right. So your QC will come down. So uh, air bubbles can also happen because uh, there's a cover slip on the glass slide. And when the cover slip is put on the glass slide, air bubbles will come in, the computer gets confused. Uh, tissue distortion, floaters. What are floaters? Sometimes because it is going through a process where it's diff you know, tissue is cut into small pieces and it's going through the liquid. So small pieces of tissue get into the liquid and, and pieces of that tissue get into the, another person's slide. But the slides are going through the stainer, so that is what floaters are. You know, the, the tissue next to the, uh, I have one to, one to three and one to four. One, two, three is a colon cancer. One, two, four is endometrial cancer of another patient. The small piece of colon cancer comes out into the fluid. And when it is staining, the small piece gets into the endometrial, uh, you know, the next slide. So that, that floater, right? And uh, cancer is the biggest example of a floater. That's like a big problem. If I have to find out whose tissue is it, we sent it for molecular testing um, for identification. Um, but uh, it can be benign. So it can be a lymphocyte from somewhere else and the computer you know, algorithm is going and looking at those uh, lymphocytes too. So floaters is a problem. Poor sectioning. Remember there's a hand that involves the glass slide to, to get the glass slide, to cut it. So that is a uh, training, which is, uh, it is not um, a, a neurosurgery, but it is, it, it is important, you know, the sectioning. If, if there is shredding, if there is shatter in the slide, uh, you cannot actually uh, evaluate the slide. So poor sectioning is important. And scanning variability. Uh, you have scanners of different, so uh, different capacity. So scanning, so I, I recently was involved in a project with bile duct cytology. We gave it to a, you know, a, a, a team and, and they scanned it. So I asked, I have to, I just want to review them. Can you give me the uh, link? And, and they sent me the link and I started looking at them. I think out of the 100 slides that we scanned, Maybe I got 20 that were well scanned. The rest of them were all blurred. And I have to go back to them to say, you know, and but this was research, so I don't mind it, right? Okay. But I cannot do that with the clinic. So clinical QC and clinical scanning is so very important 
that um, and, and all these problems can happen. Heterogeneity in uh, stromal tumor uh, in uh, infiltrate um, uh, lymphocytes distribution and stromal compartment definition. So maybe there is a tumor and there is a small uh, uh, stromal area. There is some lymphocytes in between. Now maybe when we are doing the manual count, I don't count it. You know, because it's so small, I I I, I leave it. So that has not been included in the initial um, papers that were done. But the computer can can go, the algorithms can go to very minute things, and they will start including that. So there will be a manual visual analysis versus computation analysis difference, and then we have to take care of that. Like how different the uh, difference is it, and and which one plays a better role in giving um, uh, you know the prognosis and predictive uh, thing better. So developing of algorithms. So when the algorithms are, uh, are developed from researchers, they are based on labels. And who is putting the labels? The pathologist. So right now there are programs. They ask pathologists to volunteer or they pay and they say, we will send you the slides. You mark the tumor. You mark what I want. And then I mark them. And then it gets back to the company. And then they put the whole database together and they build the algorithm around those labels. So you are dependent on um, a lot of people, right? If, if you have um, uh, errors in database, then there are errors that continue and then they are magnified. So in pathology for most, um, uh, there are labels are, are ground truth. And in histology, it relies on experts. So experts are also humans and they, you know, there, there is a variation. So uh, like in recently there was um, AI healthcare symposium at, at Emory and what was brought up was, if the thyroid cancer, right? And uh, you, th there is so much variability among experts. Like if you, some person might think it's, it's a very little stromal invasion and maybe possible, but somebody wants to call it cancer, we can actually send to an expert who will call it cancer. But another group of experts may say, I don't want this to call, I, I don't want to call this cancer. So there is variability even among experts. So it's not that um, uh, uh, straightforward. So labels and ground truth in histology is based on, um, relies on experts. Uh, this is uh, applications of computational pathology in lung diseases. This is published and this is from a research group, including Dr. This is Dr. Madhubushi's group. And I think this is uh, the future. You know, this is, this is going to happen. And these are all right now, not in the clinical uh, spectra, but a lot of papers, a lot of literature is available where algorithms have been developed and, and this is there. In, um, it, it's a possibility, uh, but still not um, clinically available. So computer-aided diagnosis, they can have mitosis counting, lymph node metastasis, histologic um, subtyping, tumor detection, bacillus, everything that I do um, can probably be done by the computer-aided diagnosis. But I hope that I put, put something in that the computer is not that intelligent intelligence as, as, as a human to catch the errors. Uh, biomarker uh, quantification and histogenomics, pdl one status, trauma inflammation score, and uh, driver mutations. It can also do prognostic predictive factors like um, what, about recurrence and we can develop. Uh, example, in lung, um, it's not, but in breast right now, we already have something effective called Oncotype DX, which gives you a, a recurrence score. So I'll discuss some cases that I, uh, we had it here in, in Emory and uh, which were sent from outside and we dealt with it. And um, uh, you know, how, how, what, is, uh, if, what was the error and what was the pathologist's role in, in uh, identifying this? So there was a duodenal no, uh, nodule biopsy. We received it, morphology compatible with neuroendocrine tumor. We do immunostains to confirm it, synaptophysin chromogranin. They were positive, fair enough. Uh, keratin positive. And KI67, we do it in all neuroendocrine tumors, neuroendocrine neoplasms to, to grade it. And so the, it is done um, imaging soft, software with preset algorithm. We are not using it clinically, but it is available. So the, the, my trainee uh, put it in the algorithm and it said 7%. Now the trainee is uh, finished uh, three months and, and probably hasn't seen so many neuroendocrine tumors and KI67 assessment put in the 7%. So when I looked at it, I said, it doesn't look 7%. Like it looks very different. Doesn't it look, doesn't it look from the image like 1% or so? She said, yeah, we will see. So what do we do now? So the, our, our traditional method is to do a manual count. Manual count is we 
we see the slide, we take a picture and we print it out or just do the counting on manual. We count 500 cells, total tumor cells, and we see how many K67 cells are there for the ratio. So out of the 500 cells, how many? So when I do the manual count, it is 1%. Now a trainee who has not done the manual count ever, never trained like that, is always dependent on the algorithm to just spit out a number, doesn't know the basis for the algorithm or what's going on. You know, so our, our we, the, we have to build a good training pipeline to identify what is wrong with the algorithm if whenever they are using the algorithm. Because algorithm, uh, they can change, they can, um, you know, just like how your, uh, it malfunctions, right? So it happens. So that is uh, the pathologist's role is understanding to catch the error in the algorithm uh, or, or know the basis for the algorithm and, and make the correction um, as needed. Second, there's a breast mass biopsy. For a nine-year-old, I have, these are real cases, but I've changed the age a little bit by chance because these are not very common. If somebody picks it up, I don't want to say, uh, you know, because it's a recorded lecture, so I've changed the name, but otherwise the information is all um, the same. So for uh, the number, the age. For a nine-year-old woman presenting with breast mass, and um, the diagnosis reads by a minute focus of invasive adenocarcinoma, one millimeter, background of extensive DCIS solid and fibriform type. Now we have a panel of ER, PR, HER2, and KI67. Um, what they do is uh, once they see carcinoma, it is ordered. So ER, PR, HER2, and KI67 is ordered. So ER came out positive 90% strong, PR positive 90% strong, HER2, IST um, is negative. And uh, the important thing to remember is the prognostic markers are done on the adenocarcinoma, only on the invasive adenocarcinoma, not on the DCIS. Now, I only have a one millimeter tumor. It, it is very, very little. And um, the k 67 is reported as 30% moderate prol proliferative and image analysis was, because we don't have the image analysis at Grady, this was sent outside. So it doesn't seem right. How did they evaluate KI-67 in this one millimeter focus of uh, So um, I had to hold back the report because the KI-67 is actually evaluated in the DCIS. So this is where the importance is, you know, realizing if I take it out, the clinician or the oncologist has to catch it. So this is where, and, and probably, you know, they might, they might, uh, but then, you know, once you see the report, you're like, okay, catch it 30%, let's go on, right? So that is the pathologist's role or, or whoever is reporting to figure out what is the stain is do, being done and what has been reported. So this is um, so this has no meaning of a KI67 with 30% because that's not the invasive cancer at all. Third case, HER2 IST. So stomach uh, biopsy. Again, the same like minute focus of invasive adenocarcinoma in a background of extensive high-grade dysplasia. And um, because it's adenocarcinoma, an automated HER2 IST is sent. It is also reported as HER2 3 plus strong. Now it's adenocarcinoma, we always do HER2 in uh, adenocarcinoma of the, uh, we, we do it. So fine, it's three plus and, and the slide is reviewed, it is three plus, um, it's strong three plus. So, um, all right, sign it out, uh, agree and, and get the report out. But again, the high grade dysplasia is strongly positive for HER2 three plus, HER2 um, her three, it's always very strong because you know high grade dysplasia, the biology, it's it still maintained. It is when it's adenocarcinoma that, that it is lost, right? So the HER2 evaluation again has to be done in the invasive carcinoma component. And when there is an invasive adenocarcinoma, is my, it's a minute focus. So is the HER2 even um, uh, needed? We only do HER2 uh, IST when there is metastatic tumors, when it is diffused and it's everywhere. So that is the last stage, right? That is your um, ad adjuvant therapy not like uh, for a small tumor, you don't do HER2 IST. So here, I think uh, what I would say is the stain was unnecessarily ordered without evaluating whether it is needed or not because of the term of um, carcinoma, the presence of carcinoma. The pre of carcinoma was very little. Now this patient also had a disc, a big, a big mass in the peritoneum, and uh, that was biopsy. Um, and thinking that um, uh, that could be metastatic cancer or, uh, you know, thinking that this is because the initial biopsy was a stomach with adenocarcinoma. There was another mass, and it, that was the, the initial thinking was that that is metastatic cancer. And uh, 
But when we said that the focus in the stomach is very small, they went to biopsy the second one. And the second mass was just completely unrelated. So this patient probably has a very small cancer with just and um, HER2 is not needed at all. And uh, when there is a metastatic, so the HER2 will have to be re repeated or done when the patient actually presents with a metastatic cancer. You cannot depend on uh, this report. So the pathologist's role is to explain that this HER2 is, is wrong and has no meaning at all. Coming to neuroendocrine tumors with neuroendocrine carcinoma. Now, this is a research question. Biomarkers in high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas of GI tract. Now, data from EMR was taken from 20, maybe 2010 to 2022, and search terms carcinoma neuroendocrine use. Now, some postdoc, somebody's involved, right? And, and from the ER, uh, EMR, you get this terms of carcinoma neuroendocrine. Best tissue block is selected by the postdoc pathology student or researcher, and um, it is sent for uh, evaluation. Now, what is the problem? Now, the neuroendocrine tumor classification has, has changed drastically. From 20, if you go to cases from 2005, 2010, 2012 even, pathologists were calling neuroendocrine carcinomas for carcinoids as well. Neuroendocrine tumors were called carcinomas. So when you look at the EMR and pull these reports, you know, you will pull out um, you'll pull out correctly that the EMR is ca calling it carcinoma, but they are fundamentally wrong. They are not, not carcinomas, they are neuroendocrine tumors or low grade. So that will distort your final, um, whatever analysis you're doing. So even with pulling out things from EMR, you probably have to review all the cases part of your research project. Include uh, um, you know, a person who is actually involved currently with that um, diagnosis and involved so that they can identify whatever tissue you're selecting is appropriate for your research question or not. Otherwise, the whole, even if you take your diligent steps to do it correctly, you're probably missing the step of, um, you know, using the correct tissue. This is a well-known issue, but we, with so much data available um, and, and so much you know, you, you think, why should I go there? Let's do this part. We, it's an unnecessary step. I have a carcinoma diagnosis. I have a list of cases. Send the tissue block and get it done. So the pathologist's role is to get it right. Get the right tissue for the right testing and get your um, get the right answer, ultimately, for uh, your uh, answer to be correct when you're uh, evaluating. Next, the role of the pathologist in molecular pathology. Those were my examples for... Uh, image analysis and uh, biomarker analysis, and how um, you know what is the pathologist's role in making uh, the right decision. Molecular testing for guiding cancer therapeutics—that is the well-known. Uh, you know, we, we cannot get it out. It, it is there. It's all everywhere. The technology testing available everywhere with multiple men vendors, and there are but there are gaps. One is economic funding and reimbursement. Um, the guidelines. Um, single gene testing versus panel testing, NCCN, um, you know, we, we look at NCCN for the guidelines, but for the most part, uh, I think all uh, major centers encourage panel testing. You do not want to uh, do single gene testing, lose the tissue, and then you find, oh, you have to go back to the panel test. Now I don't have tissue, get it back. So ordering pattern. Oncologist is at the other half. So oncologist decides what, what they want, what is the targeted therapy that they want to start. And uh, so we are um, dependent on the oncologist. Now in this gap, what I, what I see is there are um, uh, uh, advanced practice providers involved, students involved who may not be uh, so uh, aware of what next gen sequencing is, what mRNA sequencing, about the nitty gritty details of what test is being ordered. So, um, so the communication between the pathologist, between the oncologist, and uh, whoever is involved in the ordering is, is very, very essential. And turnaround time. So you order the test currently, we send it to another laboratory, which is shipped. We get the block at the lab, at, at the main campus or at Grady. We get the tissue block from the, our in-house laboratory. We ship it to another lab and it is tested. It takes two weeks and then it, is, it comes back. Then we scan it to the... System. So some laboratories, what they have done is they have inbuilt uh, in-house panels. They have trained their own surgical pathologists to 
um, diagnosed with molecular, um, you know, the common molecular testing variants and uh, the in-house, they have brought it in-house. But, you know, I do realize that at, in a big academic center, it's not possible to have small panels. You, you need an extensive large panel to, what, to give the patient the best available uh, therapy. So next gen sequencing, what is a unique genetic variance, targetable, targetable therapy, as well as prognostic factors. You can distinguish there are two tumors. You know, you need two new primaries versus a metastasis of one versus from the other. So that is another role. Atypical cell, um, reactive versus neoplastic. I have some examples, real life cases that I'll, that I'll show you. Um, is it reactive versus neoplastic? I can use neo, uh, you know, the consensus is, uh, is not possible among pathologists. So then we get back to next gen sequencing. Let's see what happens. Uncommon mutations, they can also help with that diagnosis. So morphologic differences with similar molecular signature. Um, this is a striking example. So the WHO considers smart a a4 deficient undifferentiated tumor as a sarcoma. And so it is it's a completely uh, separate entity and, and smart a4 deficient non-small cell carcinoma. Now, a smart a4 deficient undifferentiated tumor recently it is published that it is related to carcinomas than primary sarcomas. I'll get into a little bit detail about what the histopathological um, relevance is of this one. So, um, uh, and they did that by sequencing the tumors. So this is an example of smart So it's the same molecular, um, uh, a, a molecular uh, uh, abnormality, right? Smart A4 deficient. So this is with rhabdoid morphology where you see there's a large atypical nuclei with um, uh, a prominent nucleoli and it's eccentric. So this is rhabdoid morphology. This is what is poorly differentiated. It is in the lung, nothing that I can um, think this is from the lung, right? So these are the immunostains. These are the markers that I use. SMART A4, I have an immunostain for that. Now it is almost lost, right? It is completely lost here. And then Claudine 4, it's a keratin or epithelial differentiation. So epithelial differentiation is lost, and pancytokeratin is very patchy. So um, with claudine 4 loss, that's why um, it is uh, considered like uh, non-epithelial. So it was put into the sarcoma category initially. But now with the molecular testing, we know that it is closer to the uh, uh, carcinoma, epithelial differentiation, even though it is undifferentiated. And that is we, we got it from the information from the sequencing. So why is it important for the pathologist? Even though the molecular change is the same, smart A4 deficient, we have to recognize the rhabdoid morphology and, and the different characteristics. I do the immunostain and I have to say, this has no Claudine 4 and this is, uh, um, keratin is very patchy, whereas the smart A4 deficient non-small cell lung cancer is keratin will be diffusely positive. So why? Because this can um, guide the therapy. There is lack of benefit if it is a thoracic undifferentiated tumor. It is lack, there's lack of benefit of the established TKIs. And there's potential benefit from immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors because there is a high um, tumor mutation burden in these uh, thoracic tumors. And clinical trial enrollment, because they are very rare, uh, these could be included in the uh, clinical trial. So it's very, very essential to identify morphology, uh, put the correct markers, and get the correct uh, diagnosis, to do, and then differentiate between the smart A4 deficient undifferentiated tumor versus smart A4 deficient non-small cell lung cancer. Now let's go to a case of a thyroid nodule for a 60-year-old woman presenting with a rapidly growing thyroid nodule. FNA was done, it was benign. Now, ultrasound guided FNA was not done here. That's another point. Ultrasound guided FNA would have gone to that correct, uh, the lesion. We did the palpable because it, it was large and um, uh, FNA came as benign. However, it was rapidly enlarging. So the, the total thyroidectomy was done. And you can see here, it's a small nodule here. Oh, sorry. See, this, this, this was the only uh, nodule here. And, and sections were done even on frozen section. And it is very large atypical nuclei. This is like bony metaplasia, bone formation, and this is chondroid, cartilage formation. So with this atypia, mitosis, and um, it was called a high-grade sarcoma. And um, high-grade sarcoma of the thyroid and is very, very rare. So we don't have uh, 
And so we don't diagnose high-grade sarcoma just like that. We have to make sure that there is no other sarcoma outside. Maybe it's metastatic from somewhere else. So imaging was done and there was nothing. So uh, one year passed and then um, she came back for a follow-up. She doesn't, uh, so imaging was done at that time. Somebody saw maybe there is some nodule in the mediastinum and then thing came up that, you know, it was a high-grade sarcoma, it's probably metastatic. We, we don't have enough, so we, it was sent to a center, big center, right? So in the center, the imaging was um, reviewed again because it was not clear to them, so they, they did the imaging again. On imaging, there was nothing. No, no, this one ear, high-grade sarcoma, she doesn't have anything. Maybe the diagnosis was wrong. Let's get the tissue. So it was reviewed again by an expert uh, consult. And then the expert consult, um, the soft tissue consult says, you know, it is just uh, weird to me that there is chondroid, there's osteoid, but she doesn't have anything. You know, it could be just reactive, osteoid metaplasia. So, um, so what do we do now? Uh, I said, um, you want to put a diagnosis, please go ahead and it's fine. I am not going to, you know, I cannot change it because I, I don't, um, I don't know what to do. So what do we do? We said, let's do next gen sequencing on this. So this is the place where reactive versus neoplastic, you know, one person thinks it could be reactive. There's nothing happening to this person. It could be just reactive. It's not. So, uh, and then um, we got the molecular testing and then RB1, P53, and you know, with this sequencing pattern, um, this is a uh, malignant uh, tumor, right? So we have, so it is clarified. So that is where, you know, Dr. Lawson was mentioning about consensus among pathologists. And we need tools to help us to say, um, you know, who is correct. So, but these are still tools that can be errors and, and do it, uh, you know, somebody has to review. Next is identification of rare mutations. So 36-year-old woman presented with the parotid mask. Now, parotid mask, we are easily available, so send it for biopsy. FNA was done. Uh, we got the squamoid morphology, immunostains were done, CK7. You know, it doesn't look like anything which was parotid morphologically to the pathologist. What do we do? We don't know. Like, it's undifferentiated. Talked about head and neck, uh, the head and neck expert consult. Everybody looked at it. So not possible. So now it was sent for molecular testing and uh, pathogen pathogenic variants of FGFR2, IDH1, BAP1 was seen. And this is consistent with cholangiocarcinoma. Now, um, I got a liver biopsy of the same patient later, and this is squamoid morphology. And, um, the squamoid morphology is possible in cholangiocarcinomas, and it's a diagnostic conundrum in metastatic lesions because it is squamoid, but it is CK7 positive in, in in, in, in sites far away from where you would think about a, of a cholangiocarcinoma, if you see it, you have to uh, put it together. So the next-gen sequencing or, or finding a rare mutation can help you to find where uh, this tumor is coming from. So we have had uh, two, three, two cases more like this now, where there is squamoid uh, morphology. We used to get stuck with uh, doing multiple immunostains and say, may be, may not be, and things like that. But now, you know, with next-gen sequencing, IDH1 mutation or IDH2, we, we feel more comfortable. And now we have this association where squamoid morphology can be possible in uh, cholangiocarcinoma. So adoption of molecular testing. Yes. So what happened? In early days, academic centers did it all. Research, cutting edge, they were willing to take a loss, but because they felt that was the future, molecular testing, you know. But then, um, and, and, and as we went on, we keep on doing it, we thought the panel, the, the cost will come down and everybody can do it, okay? But then we went on to panel testing. With panel testing, the cost became higher, the lack of reimbursement, academic centers said, this probably is not a good idea. You know, we cannot do it. So it went to private companies now, they offer testing. They offer discounted rates, they, they, they see resale to the pharma, which academic centers probably cannot do. And, and they are offering these bigger panels. Ample resources, they offer FDA-approved tests, so the insurers are ready to pay for that. And, and we have laboratory-developed tests at academic centers, right? So we are not able to compete. The academic centers are not able to compete with uh, big, uh, big uh, private companies. So at larger centers like MD Anderson, MSKCC, they offer the extensive panels. But others, they are offering uh, limited panels. So that is what we are dealing with with adoption of molecular tests. So communication is key. We know that. 
we know that that we, we have to talk to each other, we have to meet each other, discuss our problems and find a solution. But who has the time? Everybody is like a busy day. And who has the resources to do that? And, and, and administrative pressure, get the work done, get it out. We have turnaround times. And so then the real work is, is left behind. And, and sort of, I, I'm sure you share it. I, I, I get frustrated by this. Like, this is of no use to anybody. But um, that's where we are. So challenges of integrating digital pathology into the clinical workflow, cost of initial setup, uh, but there is a great interest and uh, from uh, administration, from the department. So that, that's great. Security systems needed when integrating into the hospital systems with cloud-based and um, with hacking. Uh, it is very, very important that we invest on those systems as well. Storage of data. This is a very, very big question because this is images with high pixel, high uh, storage data needed, and, and we have to invest on, the, on that management as well. Integration of software with the digital uh, scanning systems, licensing. That's where I brought about like, um, you know, build a big, nice, uh, strong car, and then you can put the accessories into it. Um, so that's where you integrate the software. Liability issue, ultimately rest with the pathologist. So, you know, I need to be very, very careful understanding the algorithms and, and make the right decision for the patient. At least that's under my control right now, but we don't know, right? So validating algorithms with randomized control trial, that is going to be very hard where all the researchers have to talk to each other, but the question of patenting and, and it's a commercial um, aspect to it as well. So, and eliminating bias of training models, the population models. So for each, for each algorithm, do you need population specific artificial intelligence algorithms? So that's another question to deal with. Uh, so major task is early correct workflow will pay great dividends. Your investment is not lost. It, it, it'll, um, you know, just have to pay smaller, do smaller investments to do the final thing. Get a good team with all players represented. Each representative though has to be effective. Errors, inattention, even from one represent can, can be exorbitantly expensive to the whole system. And um, that's where I end. And thank you. It's a great time, December. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. I, I'll be very happy if you can send me emails or can't like, you know, questions. Um, uh, and I, I'm open to questions now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Varhani. Uh, if you have questions uh, for those who are attending online, uh, please use the Q&A feature that is located at the bottom of your screen. And while we wait on the questions, uh, I would like to remind everyone that next week we have the critical updates in clinical research, so there will be no grand rounds. Uh, to view all upcoming Winship Grand Round lectures, uh, please visit the Ground Rounds page on the Winship Cancer Center website or the Winship calendar. And I think we already have some questions uh, in the hall. Uh, you mentioned um, in the middle of your talk that there was FDA-approved AI um, software for prostate mm -hmm. cancer. I'm just wondering, what, what is the status of that? What's the major role? Is it to enhance diagnostic accuracy or is it to reduce uh, reduce workload or both. I mean, what, what is it? It's, it's, it's kind of both. So, so with, with, um, I think the, the, the first role is um, disease control because prostate cancer, you know, we have multiple biopsy scores. It, it is tedious to, and we take more time to look at it, and we can miss small cancer. So the computer aided diagnosis will be faster. So, and then it can highlight uh, in areas of interest so the pathologist can look at it uh, that way. And then um, enhanced diagnosis because uh, you know everybody thinks human error is the you know humans make the most error so computers will pick up those and then uh, the errors will be reduced. So, but I, I do think that the first role is um, uh, faster diagnosis and, and that is where I bring brought up that if it's a large scale commercial you know with lots of profit value it is probably the same time for each biopsy to be reviewed. I think. Are we using it here? No, we are not. Yeah. I don't think in US. I'm not sure though. You know, I think in Europe they are undergoing um, the trial. I think the results are going to come in 2024 about the cost benefit analysis and things like that on that. 
uh, at the uh, page. Uh, let's go. The exact name is uh, at the page, pages prostate detect. They have a website page and then. Um, Different questions now when you look at the images. Yeah, and first people have slides. So these names will actually be there. So uh, right now the data that um uh Jeff showed at the VIP Symposium that it is not really detected so now it's still the same. We have been able to manage it. Um and then a, a, any adoption of any new technology is always uh, like a scare, right? But then we learn from it that there is a learning process. And I think it's worth it. Like if um, yes, there is manually in the body, so we need to look at it. But if I have a good algorithm and uh, you know I can do it from anywhere. And for me, I really like it that I'm at Brady, but I can still do the memory cases and uh, instead of like you know, driving back and forth. Uh, and I got an opportunity to work in Brady as well because of this. I like the so um, I think the digital technology is a good thing. And, and should be adopted, um, but with a lot of caveats. And main thing is the investment. Um, and my goal for this, I really like when uh, uh, somebody asked me, I like, yes, I have to do it because the histotechs are our backbone. You know, we, without them, we cannot get a good slide. We don't have it. So that should not be neglected by uh, leadership in the process of uh, editing. And this is a part of editing editing. We have to do this because yeah, we, we have started with technologies right now. It's difficult to uh to remove people and have consultation as uh things to become more difficult and challenging. We just have to um figure out a way. So we have a question uh, online. Okay. Uh Dr. Nuka is asking as the image analysis gets better and better. Mm -hmm. It may be able to pick up changes in stroma and tumor that the human eyes may actually not be able to pick up. So can we expect to see the prediction of mutations driving malignancies earlier on? It's already happening. In research algorithms, they've already done it. They have proven that uh, they are using uh, image analysis for analyzing and, and, uh, and then predicting um, the mutations, like what, what is there. Um, so the, in research, in, in smaller data sets, it is happen. So it is going to happen, but the thing is, we have to focus on the QC and who is liable to things nature, and that is the challenge, and then bringing all the systems and the collaborators together. Um, if you, if you read the literature, the possibilities are immense. What Dr. Nuka pointed out is perfectly, and that, that is the, that is the um, attraction. Right, that the human eye is not able to otherwise see, but with, uh, with large data sets, we'll be able to pick it up. We may not be needing the molecular testing, and that's the cost benefit analysis. We don't need to do the molecular for the image itself, we can get it. Uh, but maintaining the algorithm, yeah. Yeah.
I, I think that's where it is. You know, we have this set tool, this technology, it's great. And, and human supervision of the motion is important. Uh, it goes to liability. The important question for me are liability, payment models. What is the, you know, how is the human effort going to be compensated if all the investment gets into infrastructure? Yeah. And so, in the medical and that was a lot. Yeah. All right, thank All right. you very much.